Hello and welcome again. No, I'm serious. This is it. YouTube is life. Welcome again. It's Friday. There's a, I don't want to feel, there's a feeling of a hush sense in class. Is everybody, is it the end of the week for everybody too? Is that what I'm feeling? Yeah. Yeah. So guess what? I'm not going to pile on. No homework this week. All right. I looked at where we were. I looked at what I wanted to put in the homework and I'm like, come on. Okay. So not another thing on your list. So sit back, relax, enjoy. I don't know what you're enjoying. <laughs> sit back and relax, uh, and we can make this work. I am recording the screen. I'm sharing the screen. I think it all works. So yeah, no homework assigned this week. Um, sorry. Uh, maybe the end of next week. Probably the end of next week, but you'll have two weeks to do it. And it will be on latent variable models. So it'll be the things that you're writing your projects about. And on that note, Still haven't, I did download the project. I see there are 16 projects. So I'm getting there. It's coming. So hopefully over the weekend or Monday, I'll be able to give a read through. What I will do after I read through it is I'll put your grades up on Icon and then I'll send a message to everybody just overall saying, let's get in contact about trying to plot out how to do the analysis. I'll put some comments in each of the documents about my thoughts about how to make it analyzed and so forth. Okay. Anybody have any questions for me to begin with? I should make sure that my audio is recording. It looks like it is. That's good. Okay. You remember where we left off? I described all of these, the code for the normal distributions. Uh, right here. We started talking about priors. You remember this snippet of code right here? Here's the key. We've got basically 10 regression models. Our latent variable follows the normal distribution with mean zero, standard deviation one. Not all that different from before, just a few more terms, right? Those were the priors. Uh, this was sort of it. I just wanted to give a picture to all the R object that we have here too. So right, we have the hyperparameters. We had, I think we saw this as I started building it. Um, these were all the variables we declined to the variables. Uh, block or the data block for Stan, so that we're importing all of it. And uh, just as a note, we had a 207 parameters in total in the model. Ten observed variables, uh, each with three item parameters: uh, an item intercept, factor loading slash discrimination, and item uh, unique standard deviation. Those are all. Remember, those are all regression terms, just with different labels from factor analysis. We also have 177 latent variables. And I wanted to make a point about this. If you take, how many of you are in Lisa's class right now? A lot of you. She probably doesn't de describe the latent variables as being parameters, does she? There's a big difference in how we're estimating this from how it gets estimated in other uh, non-Bayesian worlds. And that big difference is that we are um, treating the latent variables as parameters in the model itself. And in a few slides, I'll start to talk about the posterior distribution of the latent variable itself. But the bottom line is whenever the latent variables are multivariate or univariate normally distributed, and you assume the data are conditionally normally distributed, you could actually express the whole likelihood as a function that's not involving the latent variables themselves, right? Using multivariate, some statistics from multivariate normal distributions. So what that means is, we, um, in, in normal, not normal, <laughs> it's really loaded language, in non-Bayesian ways of doing this, we, we have to remove the, the latent variables from the likelihood to make estimates consistent. Except for in cases like EM algorithms where we're imputing like an expected value. For us, the expected value is not being imputed, but a, a, a draw from a posterior distribution is. So we're like an EM algorithm. We can still have the latent variable show up in our, our model and make it our algorithm and still have the results have nice properties to them. So just a heads up. The other thing I'll note with this is um, if you use other people's code or if you look at, um, there's a package that in R called Levon. Um, Turns out a grad school colleague of mine, friend of mine, Ed Merkel, created Blavon, the B in front of it, Blavon. 
Bayesian Levon, blah Vaughan. Uh, he estimates these models using what we call the marginalized likelihood. So you might hear that term sometimes. A marginalized likelihood for latent variable models is one where we take out the latent variable from it altogether. And there are some benefits to it, it also it's a lot harder to code. So I'm going to teach you what we'll call a conditional likelihood. And the, the, the idea is this, you see theta somewhere in the model itself. The latent variable shows up in the model. That's the big deal, okay? But by comparison, when we did this same type of analysis with one variable in a linear model sense, we had no parameters that involved each person. All we had were the beta coefficients, regression coefficients, um, and residual variance, right? Residual standard deviation for Stan. So this is a lot more stuff to have Stan estimate. So that has two different features that um, can be a little bit of a problem. One is that it takes a lot longer to run for the analysis. Not that much longer for this model, but for some models it will. Um, not only that, oftentimes we'll need longer Markov chains. We may need larger, larger warm-up periods. We may need larger uh, iterations themselves. Um, and it's not too bad in this model because, again, the latent variables are normal. The observed data is normal. Turns out normal distributions are pretty well behaved when it comes to data. They're very easy to work with. It's when we start to get into discrete categorical data that we start to see problems. So you're gonna see longer chains than what we do. How are we doing with all this? I feel like I need some type of, something more exciting. Friday afternoon after lunch, what's not to love? I see Starbucks, I like that. That's good. The question is, is it straight coffee or is it like cappuccino or espresso? Yeah. Coffee? <laughs> coffee? Oh, okay, so not, not, not entirely hopped up on caffeine yet. All right, um, so here is the call to command stand R, right? Very much like we had before. Again, you'll see a longer set of chains here, and I'm just gonna flip over to my R code to show that. Can everybody see my R code okay? Mm -hmm. And those of you online, if you can see it okay, hopefully you can. Um, here we have Right here, actually, I ended up changing the warm up from the slides to what I have in my code two to 2000, so. But uh, that, that is the R code for it. So let's give this thing a run. You see it runs, it takes a little bit longer, although it's still not bad, 2.9 seconds versus less than a second. Not too bad, right? Um, what's the first step we do after we check, a, we do run a Markov chain, what do we have to check? Convergence. So we do the same code where we look for the r hat and the maximum r hat across all of our parameters. So remember, 207 parameters. All the item parameters and all the thetas. Maximum r hat, 1.06. Is this converged? Oh yeah. This is a good result, right? So let's take a look at some numbers. I'll go back into r for those right here. Okay, so what do we have here? We have all of our mu's. Remember the name for mu? Item intercept, right? It represents the expected value of the item when theta is zero. It turns out in this model, because we've specified the mean of the latent variable to be zero, right? This is actually the item mean itself, our estimate of the item mean. And if we were to compare that with our data, if we were to do apply x equals, what am I calling this? Conspiracy items. Margin equals two and function equals uh, mean. 2.367 is our frequentest estimate of the mean for the first item, 2.37, pretty close to it, right? So we all see that the what we're doing here with our, we would expect that. We have flat priors. It looks like when we see the mean observed, it looks like the mean of our data as well too, right? So when we look at our data, if we fit a, an analysis like this, where the factor mean is zero, each one of these item 
intercepts is the item mean. And remember, this is a scale that goes from one to five, right? So a mean of 2.37 indicates the average person is rating that item at uh, disagree. Not strongly disagree, but just disagree, right? And you can see that is the highest mean of all of the items. Uh, and the lowest mean is what? 1.52 or something like that. So, any questions on item intercepts? Now remember, item intercept is the item mean if the mean of the latent variable is zero. I almost showed that last time. Remember the expected value I started drawing? If we would have passed that, if we didn't condition on theta, if we just said uh, we allowed theta to be random, the mean of theta was, was zero. It would, knock out the, it would knock out that lambda times the mean of theta. And so you'd get this mean itself. All right. Item discriminations. What does that represent? Or factor loading. It says, for every one unit increase in theta, we expect the response, or the expected response, goes up by that value, right? So a person with a theta of zero uh, would have an item expected response of 2.37 to the first item. A person with a theta of one would be 2.37 plus 0.74, which puts us up into like 3.11 or so, right? Or likewise, theta of negative one would move this down to below two, right? And you can take a look at all of these parameters here. Um, you can, all the other thing to take a note of this is, look at the scale of these parameters. What I mean by scale is look at the range they're in, right? The highest factor loading or discrimination is 0.997. By the way, I keep re-emphasizing the two words side by side. When I say loading, I try to say discrimination too just to re reinforce these are the same concepts. But eventually I'll just drop it. Do you, do you prefer discrimination or loading? Do you care? I'm trying to translate. All right. Anyway, 0 0.997 is the highest. 0 0.673 is the lowest. Furthermore, take a look at the posterior standard deviations. That's this third column right here. Um, smallest standard deviation is 0.609. The biggest is 0 0.838, so 0 0.065, excuse me, 0 0.609, and 0 0.0838. Those look remarkably similar in the same range. And why I'm telling you this is when you're fitting a latent variable model, you remember the slope, which is equivalent to, in this case, these parameters. This is the, our slope in, the latent var in, a, in a regression sense. The slope is units of y per units of x, or in our case, units of the item per units of the latent variable. And here, because the items have roughly the same units, they're all on one to five scale, so there's, they, va they, they vary a little bit, but the units are about the same. But the latent variable, the predictor is always the same. The latent variable, we fix the standard deviation to be one. So what we end up seeing in a lot of psychometrics is the parameters that we have for our slopes, factor loading discriminations, those parameters are much more homogeneous than we would see in a linear regression analysis. If you remember in the linear regression we ran at the beginning of the class, we had one parameter that was like 81, we had another parameter that was like 0.2, right? If you see something like that in an analysis like this where the predictor is this latent variable where you fixed the standard deviation to identify it, there's a problem. That's where I'm going for. But this is also important in a Bayesian sense because we have to specify the prior distribution for these things. So in, in the linear regression, we had to really worry about, hey, what's the, what's the scale of y? What's the scale of x, the predictor? Here, yes, we have to worry about the scale of y, but x is constant or the same predictor for the most part. So it's, it's a little bit easier to pick priors in the latent variable. That's where I'm going with this. Right? Any questions? This isn't nearly as glamorous as last time, right? Last time was much more exciting. All right. Last, we have the posterior uh, distribution or the estimates of the 
uh, in this case, unique standard deviations, not unique variance, remember, because they, they're the standard deviation parameters from the normal distribution in STAM. So these things um, reflect sort of what's left over if the latent variable were real and predicted the item itself. Okay? All right. Any questions on any of that? All right. So, at this point, in a typical analysis, we would investigate model fit. I'm actually not going to do that right now. We're going to get more into the estimation part because there's some catches to this analysis that can throw us sideways if I don't tell you about it. Um, why I say that is if the model does not fit, then all of those model parameters could be biased. Right? So when a model doesn't fit the data, big things happen. And there's a, a whole bunch of model fit differences than what um, and the latent variable model, model fit is a little bit different than when we have a single uni, univariate linear model like regression, right? What do you remember from model fit from when we did linear regression back in a few weeks ago? Posterior predictive model checks, leave one out or WAIC, right? So posterior was sort of absolute fit, leave one out, WAIC was relative fit. Both of those still are with us in a Bayesian sense for model fit. But what the posterior predictive model check is on is different. When you have a multivariate set of multivariate or simultaneous regressions in a model, a multivariate outcome model, we now have to be concerned about item, the covariance or correlation between items, how well our model recovers that. And uh, we build posterior predictive model checks in that sense to try to evaluate how well we are estimating the covariance or correlation itself between items. Also, when we get to WAIC and leave one out, we have to build a likelihood for it. But that likelihood doesn't, cannot have the latent variable involved in it. We have to marginalize across it. And that becomes a problem too. So it's a little bit more labor intensive to do model fit, but it's not bad. Not, I mean, well, excuse me. Uh, what's my spouse always say, job security? It's job security. It's a pain. <laughs> uh, it's really difficult to do It'll slow you down a little bit, but once you get the hang of it, it'll go pretty quickly. Um, the other thing that's really bad about model fit uh, in, in psychometrics is that if the model doesn't fit the data, remember, bias means the parameter is not really its true value, right? In our case, the mean of the posterior distribution, the EAP estimate of the parameter is off. But it's particularly bad also because we will see that the posterior standard deviation may be biased too, right? So I mentioned last time in, um, if you, those of you who are in ed measurement, educational measurement, if you go in the, the assessment industry, like the people up the street at ACT, what do they sell? They sell theta or some derivative of it. Yes, they're selling tests, but nobody takes the test and forgets their score, do they? You take the test to get your score. Your score comes from theta or something like theta. Even if it's not theta, it's related to theta. Pretty much theta. Um, turns out the accuracy with which we get theta is impacted by the model fit also. So if we have bad model fit, we might actually think we have more information for theta than we really do. So bad model fit um, leads to telling someone the wrong score potentially, and then being really sure that it's the wrong score. <laughs> and both of those are bad for business. Let's just put it that way, I think. I don't know. But what do I know, all right? I'm in academics. I'm just kidding. Ah, oh, okay. So I'm gonna stop and not do model fit right now because I wanna get through all the, the different model distributions and then we'll get to model fit because it's very related. So rather than have to re re reinvent the wheel every time, we're going to go through all the, the distribution first, then we'll get there to model fit. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these item parameters. Um, you may have heard of the term item characteristic curve. For those of you who have heard it, which class did you hear that in? IRT. 
Anyone want to remind me what an item characteristic curve is? It's the expected value of the item response conditional on the latent variable. It's easy to plot for one dimension. We have one theta, that's our x-axis. The y-axis is the expected value. Now in IRT class, you usually heard about it when you had binary data or, or, so, or things where the expected value was on a scale from zero to one, right? But for us, we don't have that. But we can still create an item characteristic curve. We just don't call it that usually in factor analysis, right? But let's do that. This is an item characteristic curve. How do we form it? The y-axis is the expected value of y. We defined this before. In fact, it's in our model, right? We put this in here. We had to define it right here. That is the mean for each item. So literally, we could go and make a plot of the expected value. And actually, I'm going to do this in my R code here, too. So I'm going to take item number three here. I'm going to plot this thing. But I'm doing this in a, a really crazy Bayes sense. Why am I saying really crazy? OK. So the red line right here, that red line is the expected value of item three's response. Conditional on theta ranging from negative three to three, uh, using the EAP estimated item intercept and factor loading slash discrimination parameter. Right, so I literally went to the table that I had discussed in the slides. Let's take a look at item three. The intercept is 1.88. If I flip over to here, you'll see at zero, we're right about 1.88 on the y-axis, right? The black line on this plot is every posterior draw from our Markov chain. So I created the plot, and I plotted every single line. Why am I doing this? Because typically, you see in We'll see the, the, the dashed line. The dashed red line is, is what we would call the ICC. That's our, at our parameters. But the cool thing about Bayes is we can visualize how much variation there is in this well. Turns out, I don't think this is a lot of variation. It tend, even the, the flattest lines aren't that far off from the red line, right? Now, what else is on this plot? Yes. No, no problem. Uh, is, is that red line based on the 177 values? That no, that this is a good question. No, what I did was just hypothetically took theta at 0.01 increments from negative 3 to 3. So this is taking just the item parameters and saying if, if we were to observe somebody on these levels, this is what we would get, right? Okay. Yes? Yes, that's correct. EAP mu, EAP lambda. What about the dependence between EAP mu, mu and EAP lambda? Well, they may, not be independent. they may not be independent, but that's okay. Right? We often don't think about that dependency. In fact, here we could, if you'd like to investigate it, would you like to investigate it? Let's take a look. Let me grab my numbers. Here, item parameters. These are the item parameters right here. So I need column one and column two. So let's do this. Plot x equals item parameters one and y equals item parameters two. This is a plot of the posterior relationship between, this is mu right here. And this is lambda. So that plot makes me think, <laughs> you ever, uh, how many of you have a background in psychology? You remember the Rorschach test? Like the old, like the ink plot? What do you see here? We're going to play Rorschach scatter plot. Do you see a correlation? 
I don't really see one, but I can't really tell very well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate that correlation too. Correlation of 0.01. So, but Hong, the the deal with this is even if they were related, the model still indicates that it's coming. There it is. This plot is still the same, right? It's just if we were to make inferences about one or more of those parameters simultaneously, we would have to consider what that correlation said. There's a very good question that you asked. Them. So, any other questions on this so far? I haven't gotten to the blue lines yet. Yes? So, in this plot, mu defines the center, and lambda, how much mu can That's it, yeah. Yeah, so in fact, we can even figure this out. Mu right here will be at its, um, the parameter is 1.88 for item three. So we would, right at zero, that red line is at 1.88. And then at one, the red line will be 1.88 plus uh, that value. Thank you for asking. But we are interpreting this just like we would a linear regression is what a, a bigger picture. The other point I want to make is take a look at the dashed blue lines. Right? This is at the number one. That's the, the minimum number we're allowing for the item. And this is at the number five. And I'm putting that here because right, this is our, if you think about what we've assumed theta to follow, theta follows a normal distribution with the mean of zero standard deviation one, meaning if you think of that standardized normal distribution, 99% of the density is between negative three and three, just about 99%, maybe a little bit more than that, right? And so that means once you get past the theta below negative one, this model is suggesting that you, we expect you to answer below, strongly disagree. That doesn't fit. This is where, remember the, the imposter I had or whatever the, the Among Us picture my son likes? That's the sus part of this, right? That is not a real good idea of what data should look like. This is not posterior predictive check, by the way. This is the expected value. If we wanted to posterior predictive check this, what we would do is we would end up sampling at random from a normal distribution where this is the mean and there's some standard deviation with it. So the range of values that we might get from a posterior predictive check would go potentially, it depends on where the values of theta end up, and you'll see that on the next slide, they're right. They actually end up somewhere right around here. But our posterior predictive check, if we we're doing just straight bays with this, we'd be like, yeah, that's, that's really not good, right? We're going out of bounds. This is motivating why we use a discrete distribution for items like this, or why we should be using a discrete distribution for an item like this, because it really doesn't fit with what our data happen to be. What do you think? You want to see a different item? Uh, here, look. which item would you like to pick? Ten. Item 10, you got it. Is that because the mean is the lowest? Let's see what item 10 looks like. So by the way, you can play with this in the R script if you just change this to 10 and rerun this little section of code right here. Oops, I ran. There's the plot of uh, mu. There we go. So item 10, I guess I didn't put the legend on here. Did I, did I delete my legend? No. I just saw it. Where'd it go? There's the legend. There it is. What do you think? Item 10 looks pretty bad too, right? I mean, somewhere below, somewhere not even a standard devi deviation below our average of theta, and we're saying, yeah, right? So, so it would be interesting to think about how this curve changed when we put in a nonlinear link function, right, in the analysis. Anyway, what do you think? So you can do this with regular non-Bayesian work as well, although I just like seeing sort of how much error there is in the data, right, the black lines, those, those are fun to see. Any other questions on this?
You want to see any other items? All right. Wait a minute. Jonathan, I have a quick question. Go so and I, this kind of goes, we, we did this with Lisa's um, recent CFA project. Yeah. So, you know, for some of these questions, it doesn't actually go out of bounds potentially until like two or three standard deviations away from the mean. So is there like, I know there's not like a 100% right answer, but where would you start to acknowledge like, oh, maybe we should just use CFA because the chances of someone being four standard deviations away is just not plausible. I will make a very, <laughs> what sounds to be very radical proposal and that we should never use discrete items with CFA. We should never use a normal distribution with okay. discrete items. That's, that's okay. it. Um, there are some papers out there by colleagues I just saw in Monterey, actually, that suggest, well, you can approximate it well if the mean of the item is sort of in the middle and you have a symmetric distribution of responses, but that's a lot to, to, to get to. Um, so why we would use CFA on data like this, particularly in this day and age where we can easily use a categorical distribution is, is really, uh, it's just a bad choice. That's how I view it, personally. How's that answer? How many of you want to disagree with that? I love it. I mean, that, that makes sense. I just, um, I would agree with that, but I know, would you say that's kind of an artifact too of like what people have understood for years and not, not wanting to like reinterpret things in a, in IFA framework? Yeah, I think that's, there's a whole lot to it. Um, if your training doesn't involve item factor analysis, if your training doesn't involve Item response theory, this is usually what you will know, factor analysis, usually in an exploratory framework. Um, that's part of it. Another part of it is old habits die hard. Um, so a lot of the training we give, particularly if you think of the people who, who are using these methods but aren't trained in methodology, who, who are most of the people who are using these methods, right? People take a class or take a whatever, not, not a lot of training on it, and they go and use it based on what the journals say that there are, that usually means that they have the first class in this. And the first class in this still is based on methodology we don't tend to use anymore if we've studied methodology. And it's difficult. The methodology largely, like if you think of exploratory fact analysis, existed large, largely before computers. And some of the rotations we use in exploratory fact analysis were built because they could be done by hand. Uh, my, again, I mentioned him multiple times that he was a big influence on in my life. Rod McDonald used to call these things devices, like crude ways of doing statistics before we had more precision instruments to be able to do so. So, yeah, it's tough. It's tough to say why it is. Um, you know, if you're, if you, you know, I'm going to teach you the ideal here. And the ideal is if the data are discrete, use a discrete distribution to model them. That's simple. However, in practice, like, if you get a job where you publish or perish, and a reviewer says, yeah, why are you using a, you know, multinomial here? Just put a factor analysis into it. Well, you're probably going to have to make some trade-offs. Um, but just realize, like, if you know the theory and understand why it is and understand the ramifications of making these choices, I think that's the best you can do when I try to train you. Um, but, yeah, in practice, it's a lot harder. Does that make sense? Sort of a fatal... Yeah, issue. thank you. Other questions on this? Yeah, seriously, I'm telling you. Don't say that factor analysis is, is wrong. I'm telling you, factor analysis or normal distributions for discrete items is probably not a good choice. Yes? Um, so, you know, you, I think that you want to use like a discrete distribution. But if you don't have the sample size, why not people into those categories? Would that be a reason to use this? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I don't think so. Sample size, so yeah, there, there is a problem. And actually, this is why I love this class. Because if only there was a way we could sort of hedge our bet with prior distributions to give us some information. So yes, if you don't have a big sample size, don't have discrete categories, you're going to have to make some trade-offs, right? Don't have enough people in each category. And we're going to see that as we go forward with this. 
I haven't modeled these data with a nominal response model, but I'm about to because I've got to build the lecture for it, and that's coming next or in like three models from now. But uh, we're going to see that. We're going to see what happens. Uh, we need enough people in a category to sort of give us parameters that bound the category itself. Uh, so yeah, it could be difficult. But I, my tendency for that is to think that we tighten a, a prior a little bit when we still allow that to, to be how we model the data a little bit better. So, but again, we're making choices though. Huh? Yeah. Or what is another option be to rescale it zero one? Oh, oh, there you go. I haven't thought about that. Yeah, like points out of five, something like that. Yeah. Haven't thought about that. I wonder, I don't know, because if you use a beta, at least it's a more malleable distribution. There's, there's a research idea for you, right? Because if you have a more malleable distribution. Um, so again, what Alfonso is talking about is if we take this part right here, if we said Y is no longer just one, two, three, four, five. But maybe it goes, we divide y by six, right? So now it's one, six, two, six, three, six, four, six, five, six, right? So it's between zero and one. And then we, instead of using normal, we use a beta distribution. Now the beta distribution goes between zero and one, but it has all sorts of shapes, right? So it's a little bit more malleable. That might be something to think about. Uh, it does. That's right. It will have the same number of parameters. It might fit the data, but hey, there's, there's another, yet another research project for you. So, um, that's a good thought. I hadn't thought about that. I still think there'll be some danger because each, each point is still discrete. Um, but I think you'll, you probably get a better approximation to what's happening with it than you would with what we're doing with the straight linear no, uh, normal distribution. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, would we, going back to that, would, you know, I'm not trying to say that the idea of factor analysis is wrong. It's the mismatch between the distribution and the data. And let me give you another case in point. Um, it's a project I have that won't go away. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we have binary items. We have three category items. We have four category items. And then we have one item, I think I mentioned this, that has sort of a distance, like where you, a, a person had to mark the right spot, and people have measured the distance far away. So that distance is in like centimeters, down to fractions of a centimeter. Not quite fractions, but still, <laughs> it's down to a number that's a little less discrete. When we put this into an analysis model, we used binary, a binary assumption for the binary items. We use a multinomial assumption for the, the multi -cat, like three and four category items. And then for that one item where we had the distance, that's where we brought back this normal assumption. Right? So there are places to understand where it fits, where it goes. And then that, that uh, actually, then what, ap what, happened to me, you know, what happened was the, the mean of it was sort of the expected distance for someone who had a zero value of the trade, and then the, well, it was a different, slightly different model, but if it were this model, this would then be, for every in unit increase in the trade, how much closer they got, because the farther away they were, it, the more wrong their answer was. But again, I think what I'm trying to get you to think about, I don't know that I want to say that there's right or wrong answers, particularly, this is, this is bad, let's, let's just be real. <laughs> you don't want this to happen with data, right? This is a complete mismatch of data and assumption. That's, that's not, nothing good in statistics ever starts that way, right? But in a lot of normal, in a lot of cases, it's sort of ambiguous. And I think where I want you to think about with this class is it's no longer you have to do all one way or all another way, it's a choice, it's a modeling choice. And if Alfonso looks at it and says, I'm gonna use a beta distribution, and I look at it and say, I'm gonna use a multinomial, and for whatever reason, my multinomial breaks because I didn't have enough people in certain categories and his doesn't, he's probably going to be closer to a better answer than otherwise. But who knows? Does that make sense? All right. I'm trying to like 
want, I want you to, th to think closely about the, 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 uh, the, the relationship between your data and the model you're building. And, that's, and, the, and rather than, I feel like in a lot of our psychometric classes, we just like, oh, you're just gonna run IRT, or you're just gonna run CFA, or put it in a structural equation model. No big deal. It's like, no, 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 let's hold on a second. Let's look at the data. Let's look at the model and then combine them in certain ways. Cool? Other questions? It's a lot for a Friday. How's the pace? We're good? Too slow? Okay. There's a lot to this. All right. Let's talk a little bit about, actually, go over here. I wanted to show you, and I should have put this in my slides, it's amazing how like I try to think through things as well as I can, and then I, I get to a spot and I'm like, ooh, anyway. Uh, it's me like, what am I gonna talk about with this? But really what I wanna show you is, I'll take this, MCMC MC dense of, here I want, Let's take, let's take a look at the posterior distribution with these parameters. Let's take lambda 10 because that was just the item we were at. Because, oops. Oh, dense, not dense. All right, so that's our posterior distribution of the 10th factor loading slash discrimination. And I want to talk a little bit about where that comes from. How do we get that? Basically, what is the likelihood that goes into that? Because I want you to think a little bit about that too. I sort of haven't had a lot of technical discussion in this class about likelihoods and so forth, but I want to start talking a little bit more about that, particularly for those of you who, well, to be honest, work in my program or work with me. Um, we talk likelihoods a lot in what I do, okay? So remember, in, in Bayesian statistics, the posterior distribution is the distribution of a set of parameters conditional on the data, right? And then we say, oh, that's proportional to the distribution of the data conditional on those parameters times the prior distribution of those parameters, right? This is all familiar. So I broke that down for one item, and I'm showing you this for the group of parameters responsible for that item. And actually, um, the comment hung that you made about parameters potentially being correlated in posterior. This is why I'm actually showing it for all the set of parameters for, for it. So this is a posterior distribution that would be for three dimensions. We can't really plot this, right? We can't, we could plot it if there were two param parameters, we'd have like a three dimensional graph. It'd take a four dimensional graph to see the, like the surface of this thing, right? But I just wanna think through it conceptually. So this is the posterior distribution, right? In the plot that you just saw in R, this is taking that four dimensional thing and smushing it into two dimensions. It's just the two di marginalizing, looking at it in two dimensions, right? That's lambda. So what, it, what contributes to it is what's important. Here, I have, oh yeah, that's the density of the data. Well, Y actually here is just the one item itself, right? Because we assume each item is independent, this item's parameters only depend, like the, the, the model data likelihood, the, part, the first part of the right-hand side of the proportional to, is just that item by itself, just it, okay? So let's talk about the prior then, right? I put the prior here to make this look like a little bit of a proper distribution. By the way, we're conditioning on the things that are the parameters of interest here. Theta could be there as well, but I'm trying to marginalize theta out and this still works. Um, what is that distribution? Again, for one item, this, this part right here, it's what we specified in STAN, right? So what I wanna link for you to, link to is when we say an item follows a normal distribution, what we're specifying is this part right here in the Bayes sense. The posterior, the first part of the posterior density, which is the likelihood of the data itself. So when we go into STAN and we say something we input as data 
has a tilde afterwards, Stan is reading that as this part right here. Okay? Pretty cool, right? Now this last part, up here, when all three appear in parentheses with commas, we call that a joint distribution. But you remember for the priors, we specified prior distribution separately. Multivariate normal for item intercepts, multivariate normal for the loadings or factor discriminations, and then exponential for um, the unique standard deviation. Because they are independent, we actually can show that the joint distribution is equal to the product of the marginal distributions. This is sort of a math stat idea. So what we've ended up doing is if we go back to Stan code, when we say lambda is multivariate normal, for one item, we're saying lambda is univariate normal. And what we just specified was that part right there. Right? When we say mu is multivariate normal for all the items, that means for one item it's univariate normal, and we just specified this prior. And then finally, when we say psi is exponential, now exponential is not a multivariate distribution. So this, this code right here, remember I talked about an overloaded function last time, weird computer language. Basically that's taking 10 univariate exponential distributions. That's what it's assuming. That means we had just specified this distribution here. And so, do you remember the plot we had in the slides of the height of the density of these things? Right? This is the, this is the density for normal 0, 100. This is the density for exponential 0.1. Right? When those densities appear here, the value of the function is the height of that line multiplying each. Right? So when Stan is considering a, a proposal of a new parameter, it's going to multiply it by the height on the density for each of those. So what I'm trying to tie together with this slide is that the choices you're making in Stan code right here is actually you are designing what the posterior distribution and the components of it look like when you go forward. Right? And so when you think about why informative priors are so influential, it's because one of these might have a very small height to it, right? Remember, this is a product, right? So if one of those is zero, that means everything over here is zero, which means there's no chance that parameter can take that value, right? You can think about how you can, how priors have an influence on data this way. This is how to think about it, okay? The other part I wanted to mention to you is remember, for an item, we say that y, now y is a column vector. We have 177 observations. That means each one by itself follows a univariate normal distribution, right? So if you want to think about like the ratio of information coming from data versus the information coming from prior, this is where to think about it. Right? The information coming from the prior is 177 times of the height of a normal somewhere, right? And then one times the height of a mu, one times the height of a lambda, and one times the height of the psi, right? So if you go with the balance of information here, when you get more and more data, why the data overwhelmed the prior and, and start to, is because the prior is only contributing a bit of, info, just a little bit of information, so long as it's not overly informative, right? And so the, when you choose priors, think of it that way. Why am I choosing it this way? I'm choosing it this way because it's sort of the balance of the data I have, 177 observations, which, by the way, is not large for psychometrics. If I ran over to ACT and said, let's do ACT with 177 people, they'd laugh me out of, out of business, right? That wouldn't work, right? But you can see the point of, that I'm trying to make. Like if you're thinking about what's informative versus what's not, it's all a matter of relativity. Like what is the, how much data do we have? How much signal in the data are there? And how much, how much, how much you know, what are you forcing the density of the prior to look like? Yeah. Um, so, for example, for Stan, is it, is it computing the, 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 the joint posterior at the right level, or is it doing it at the... Parameter level. I, I haven't got, I don't remember. I read the... <laughs> 
pleasure reading. I was on vacation. I read the whole manual. And at one point, I, I, I knew this. I'm not sure. In building the algorithm on the, um, on the coding side, we talked about this as blocking, like where you choose to look at the analysis parameter itself. So I'm not entirely sure where, this, where it's picking it. I like to think it's parameter part parameter, in which case uh, this would simplify a little bit. You know, if we're looking at mu only, we'd only write this as a function of mu. We condition on the, the current values of the, the other parameters in the model itself at that time. So it still would work out to just be a function of mu and then the prior for mu for it. There's some benefit to doing that. However, um, it's difficult. <laughs> so I'm going to give you too much information here. CMD stan R allows you to, uh, so R stan allows you to run each one chain per core on your, on your machine because the chains are independent. And independence in st st statistics means you can calculate something at the same time. When you have a joint distribution like this, when you have three parameters, there's no guarantee that this posterior distribution is independent. So you couldn't break this into three independent runs simultaneous. Right? So the question then becomes in a coding sense, what's more efficient? Is it more efficient to look at three simultaneously or not? However, in this model, when we specified the items, the items, because we're specifying them, each of them is univariate normal, we just define them to be independent conditional on the parameters they have. So we could, in theory, split up each item separately do them all at the same time, where item one's parameters aren't informant item two's parameters. That I don't know exactly. Yeah, I think that's what I was asking. Yeah. <laughs> so there are some, in, in a Markov chain for psychometric, um, for psychometric models, you could actually do this. Um, let me get to my slides. Uh, if this, if this too, is this too much information? Okay. Like if you run your chain, you could do the item step, right? And this item step right here could split things into each item. One, two, ten. So all these are in separate, right? And then you collapse them again, right, into the same form. So you, you go out, you get new parameters, you bring them back and then do the person step. And then each person is actually independent with this model too. So we could separate that too. So we had, a, we had a computer that had 177 processors. When we get to the first item step, we could use 10 of those, you do all 10 items separately all at once. Bring those item parameters back. When we get to the person step, we do all 177 people separately all at once. Does that make sense? And, and so when you see CMD stan R, it actually has a feature called within chain um, multi-threading. I don't know how to describe it. There's an option in the sampling. If you go look in the, the options list for sample, and one of those options is called MPI. MPI is a standard we use to distribute processes that have shared memory. <laughs> so it's like a multi-threaded process, and that's where you can not just run um, separate chains, meaning different memory, different cores, but then different cores, same memory within. Anyway, long story short, long time ago, it's like 2005, I, was, I like coding, right? So I was, uh, I was playing around with this with a student where we tried to see, and at, the t at that time in the way we coded things, it was really inefficient to multi-thread a, a very small model like this. There's an overhead for splitting the processing that goes on. So it, um, depending on the size of model, at some point it makes it more efficient to do within chain multi-thread simultaneous to between chain multi-thread. But uh, I, I don't know. Anyway, too much information. <laughs> I've lost you now, right? How many of you care? No. Do you even care? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. I know this answer. Other questions? Yeah. Um, if we are assuming that all of the 
and items are important as a big comment after the line after. Why are we assuming um, parameters for each? Ah, that's the. So that's a great question. We are actually not assuming the, in, the parameters are independent. What we're specifying is that their prior distributions are independent. So, so this is the impact of prior versus the result. And, and we, there's nothing stopping us from creating a prior that, where the parameters might be dependent. But the hard part is, I don't know how to do that. Okay. Think of it this way. In a linear regression, let's imagine we had Two predictors. Actually, no, one predictor. This, this is real data. We have an intercept, we have a slope. What's the correlation of the intercept and the slope in a linear regression? Like a prior correlation? I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know what to say for it. It's very difficult to say. So generally speaking, for um, most of our parameters, we will assume the parameters have independent priors. But then once we analyze the data, it may, they may or may not lead to parameter results where the parameters have independent posteriors. Okay? Now, why, actually going one step further, probably too much information again. But I like this, this plot. This was mu on the x-axis, lambda on the y-axis. The only time we would really need to worry about whether there's dependency there is if we're making some linear combination of mu and y, and we want to talk about their distribution. Um, so for instance, if we take the mean, the EAP estimate of the y-x axis and add it to the EAP estimate, uh, estimate of the y-axis, then we want to figure out what like a standard error for, is for it, then it's the mean of one plus the mean of the other plus two times the covariance between the two. So we have to worry about it there, but it's usually not um, something we worry about for one iteration of the chain. Too much information again. It's TMI Friday. Anybody want my bank card number? <laughs> <laughs> Too much information, right? All right, what's up? Next. Okay. Should we talk about theta a little bit? Get ready, buckle those seat belts, folks. Turn on the airbags. Theta is very interesting, not really. But these are all the 177 latent variables. You see R hat, everything's converged magically, which is actually really impressive. When we get to non-normal distributions, that's really hard to do, but. So I, instead of looking at that table of thetas, I put them into a histogram. Look at that. We've got a pile of people down here at the bottom. A little bit above negative one. So when I was pointing at the slide, turns out where our curves are going past our boundary is sort of where the floor of theta happens to be as well too. Right? So we have a lot of thetas here. The other thing it turns out is if we were to look at this distribution a little bit more, now this is the EAP estimates, right? This, each person has 2,000 thetas that we sampled. We took the mean, excuse me, the mean of all 2,000. This is a plot of the means. This is if we took all 2,000 samples times 177 people and made a density of it. So you can see this is also weird, clearly not normally distributed. But Remember, the prior was normally distributed. Doesn't mean the posterior is, right? Here's the all thetas as well. Actually, this is the EAP. This is the density of EAP. This is the, the all thetas, pardon me. This is all thetas right here. This is all two, 2,000 times 177 thetas. It looks a little bit more, shall I say, normal, right? And here's two densities of theta. Maybe it's Halloween, they look like witches' hats or something. <laughs> right. Well, I put this out there just to note a couple things, right? So, number one, they're not perfectly smooth with 2,000 steps, right? If we wanted them to smooth out, we'd need to run a longer chain. So, if ever we're interested in um, comparing two thetas, we, we may want extra chain to get a really good sense of those quantiles of the theta distribution. So we don't see the sort of wrinkles that we see right here. 
This, what I'm arguing is that those wrinkles right there are effectively sampling error in that our chain only has 2,000 samples. And if we were to sample it longer, it would get smoother. But the other part is take a look at how wide the distribution interval is, right? A theta of zero, if we were to, to try to put a credible interval around it, in fact, I can do that. Let's take the first theta here. The 95% credible interval says it goes between negative 0.4 and positive 0.4. It's a big range, right? That is what I want you to, the nice thing about Bayes is you can start to visualize how different or how similar people are when it comes to thetas. Think of it this way, these theta estimates are where we draw, well, depending, there's, there's multiple scoring methods for how we do assessments. But each of you have most likely took the GRE at one time in your life, right? Your GRE score comes from a theta. The GRE, just think about it. Uh, you have to get a certain score. I talked about this in class, right? The minimum score, I think we even said this, like 300 is it? Or I don't know, the sum of the two. I don't know what the minimum is, but you know, you can think about it. If you have a person whose EAP estimate is right at the minimum, I mentioned, the probability there above it is only 50%. Let's we'll just draw the minimum on that, right? That's how that works. The other part of it is, if you're ever in my shoes, and you, every year you get, it's nice to have students want to come to work and study here, right? And we get applications. Some of those students we want to put forward for scholarships. In the scholarship room, they want to see that GRE, and now we're comparing students who have GREs that are like one or two points off is that a significant difference? Significant in a meaningful way, right? The effect size of it is very small. So in fact, one of the motivations, GRE used to have a different score scale. It used to go by 10, 10 point increments from 200 to 800 like SAT does. One of the rationales they used to go for the one point increments is that people were making too many decisions. If somebody had like a 600 versus a 590, they said the 600 was much better, but you couldn't say that right, with the data that we have. So when you look at the thetas here, these are the scores you're talking about with people. And for most assessments, this is a 10 item assessment, it's not very long, right? This is why we need lots of data to make comparisons when we make decisions about people. How are we doing? Here's another plot that's interesting. This is the expected value, the EAP estimate eta, of theta by the standard deviation of theta, right? This is the kind of the inverse of item information curves, or test information curves, right? Remember, in, in IRT, a test information, well, it comes from a different, it, it's formed differently, so, but you can think of it this way, right? It's precision by location. What is it telling us here? Well, if you look at this, what's, this is a plot that blew my mind, because if you run a factor analysis in a frequentist approach, right? This is flat. This is not curved. And I'll show you why in this another set of slides. Why it's curved here in a Bayes sense comes from variation in our chain. In a frequentist sense, we calculate this with point estimates, fixed point estimates. For Bayes, we're calculating this for every step of the chain. And it's just like when we looked at, um, remember the standard errors of beta in our linear models? They were different than what we would find if we found standard errors in frequentist settings. And that was because we allowed the residual variance to, to shift. This is what's happening here. There's variation in our parameters in our model. And that variation is showing up in our precision of theta. Now, Think about what that means. This, particularly those of you who study ed measurement. In a typical calibration of an item response model, we get a really big sample size. We estimate item parameters, fix those item parameters, then estimate theta or some derivative of theta, like the test characteristic curve or some other, there's, you know, the, the different estimation methods for scores that we use, right? But the first step of that is we need a really big amount of items, or sorry, sample, uh, people taking the test to fix those item parameters 
for it. And the reason for that, in a large scale sense, oh, this is not over here, sorry, it was over here, is that right there. The posterior distribution of lambda is wide. If we were to do this, take these data with 177 people and fix lambda at its EAP estimate and then get a score for people, we would be losing the information or the lack of information. The uncertainty in our item parameter estimates wouldn't carry over to the uncertainty in our people. And so this is one of the interesting things about psychometric models that you don't think about until you get into the Bayes world. And it's that the uncertainty of a person estimate is actually informed by uncertainty of the item parameters. In large scale assessment, why we call it large scale is because the bigger the sample size, the more narrow this interval is so that we can take one number to summarize it. Before we largely knew about Bayes, we knew that was a problem. But in Bayes sense, what ends up happening is we get distributions where that uncertainty for our item parameters will look like uncertainty for theta. That's a good thing to me, particularly in assessment. It's really bad to me to make a claim about somebody like, that's less precise than it really should be, right? So if we say, we know all the standard, or better yet, we know the reliability, we know the conditional standard error of theta for a given score is this, but we did that because we limited our distribution of the item parameters here. Um, that's bad. That's, that's not good to do. That's overselling the certainty we have in theta. And this butts up against a statistical property we see a lot, particularly in psychometrics, which is where error propagates, right? Error in, theta, in lambda and the other parameters should show up as error in theta, right? But if you're fixing those parameters to set values, you're not letting it do that, leading you to believe you have more certainty about your result than you really do. So it's not going for, right? Think about that when you, if, how many of you have had to do a calibration before? Or, right? What's your sample size that you used? 5,000, that's good, 5,000. And probably had very small standard errors on your item parameters, right? But this is why we call it large scale assessment when we fix the item parameters. So here's a question for you. Could we do small scale assessment if we didn't fix them? What do I mean? These, re these results right here come from lambda wigg wiggling all over. In the non-Bayes sense, that's fine. I mean, I mean that's, that's unheard of, excuse me. In, to, to a regular frequency, when I did straight IRT the way I learned it, which was not Bayes, how would you do that, right? You'd have to somehow take posterior draws or somehow simulate the item parameters to show what happens. But here, it's okay, it's built into the algorithm itself. So what I want you to think about is, particularly in a set, those of you in med measurement, we call it large scale assessment, but that comes from the idea that we're gonna fix parameters at values that have small standard errors. But can we still use these methods in small scale cases if, they, if we allow that error to propagate, to go to theta? What do you think? Challenging your, your thinking on this. By the way, I'm not saying large scale assessment is wrong. In fact, why we call it large scale is to prevent this from happening, right? Is to have very little error propagating. That's a good thing. We, we thought about that. But could we still use this for small scale operations if we allow it to happen? I think yes, that's my own thing. I want you to think about that. It's okay. It's okay to disagree with me. In fact, I encourage it. It helps me learn if you disagree with me. Your perspectives are important. All right, last time. Last, last part about theta. This is the total score for each person. I just summed up their 10 responses. This is the theta estimate. And that is a pretty high correlation. 
But it's not perfect. Right, by the way, this is the EAP theta. I should have put expected value of theta, but I got lazy because I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, I'm never going to have slides for class. Anyway. But there are some interesting features here, right? If you look at, so you can tell these are almost evenly spaced, right? That's because there are a bunch of people who had the same total score. But there is variation in theta for some of the total scores. Do you have any idea why that might be? This is just sum score, but the vectors might be different. Yeah, the sum score itself, that's right, exactly. The, the theta themselves, if we look at the pattern of responses, it's different. And the reason why patterns matters in this model is because we've allowed lambda to vary. Right? Actually, technically speaking, I know this sounds a little crazy, it's because lambda varies from item to item. And psi varies from item to item. If we were to estimate this model with one lambda and one psi, what we would get here is near perfect correlation. I'll show you that later. If you want to play with that on your own, because it's a weekend coming up, why not? What, a, what better thing is there to do than to, to fix lambda and psi, right? Seriously, actually, I would play with it. <laughs> Try that out, see what you think. This is sometimes called the congeneric items model in, in factor analysis, meaning each item has its own set of parameters, as opposed to a tau equivalent items model or a parallel items model. The tau equivalent items model has a different variance for each item, but the same factor loading. And a parallel items model has the same factor loading and the same unique variance in our model. And the, believe it or not, the perfect correlation between, per, uh, between score and latent variable only comes under parallel items. Now you may say, what's the big deal? The correlation is, is small. Yes, the correlation is small, but think of it this way. If this was an important assessment and you had a total score, look at these people right here where the total score is like 22. The range in theta goes from a little below zero to a little below one. That's a big range, right? So you think all these people have the same score, but who knows? I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's precision. So, all right. Where do we get the posterior distribution of theta? I only have like two minutes left, but posterior distribution of theta, we can draw that out too, right here. Theta given y. This is the theta step. So I believe what's happening, when I've written these algorithms, I do the item parameters, sample those within one iteration, hold those at their sampled values, and then I go to the theta separately. So I only write this as a function of theta, even though the item parameters are held at the values that I just sampled them to be. The distribution of theta given y, what is that? It turns out that, because of local independence or conditional independence, is the product of the likelihood of y for each item. That is literally taking the height of the normal distribution and making, multiplying it across these 10 items. Right there. So that's where conditional independence forms that likelihood. Right there. And that's the key to think about this. When we say conditional independence in an IRT sense, we're literally saying how do we form the data likelihood function. And get this, remember there was this thing called the Bayesian flip I sort of talked about. This function right here is notated differently, but if you're not using Bayesian, this is the same likelihood you'd use in a frequentist sense to maximize conditional on theta. The right-hand side is identical. How we notate the left-hand side is different. It's called the Bayesian flip. One's the likelihood of the parameters given the data, one's the likelihood of the data given the parameters. And it's like the weirdness of all of this, but it's the same on the right-hand side. All right, how are we doing with this? Is this interesting? You want, this is the psychometric content, right? I don't want to just gloss over it. If you really want to have some fun, take a look at my scores lecture. The part I was going to show you was, um, we can actually derive what the distribution of 
the data R, the marginal distribution, but we can also derive the distribution of the factor itself using some matrix algebra. The mean of the factor is that, the covariance matrix is that, the slides tell you that, and you can put a hashtag on that, WTF template. So if you remember anything about this class, it's WTF template. For those of you who don't know what WTF is, it's what, V, and an obscenity. What the, for real? No. I won't say it in class, professional. Thank you for your time. Have a great weekend. Uh, no homework, none of that stuff, and I hope to be in touch with the project. All right, thanks everybody online. See you next time. Take care.